Hello and welcome to the CG Pro Podcast. Uh, today we have another amazing episode with you, with uh, with you, Iran. I'm very excited to to welcome Iran Dinner today. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I love to do a quick introduction and and then we'll get into it. But uh, for anyone out there who's interested in in what we're doing, we are CG Pro. We're a school. And you can find out more about us at becomecgpro.com. So um, yeah, today's amazing guest is Aran, and Aran is a visual effects supervisor, among many other things, which we'll get into. Is an author and an educator, a visual effects supervisor who's done some amazing work on uh, some incredible movies and TV shows, and has won some awards, including an Emmy and several VES awards. For his work, um, works at uh, currently at Fuse FX, and um, yeah, welcome, Aran. A Thank pleasure you. to have you on today. Thank you. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to to start this off. Just ask you a little bit about uh, you, the the beginning of your journey into into visual effects. How how that kind of happened for you? What were, were there some inspirations that kind of led you towards visual effects um the beginning was kind of an accident um i was a musician uh i still am i guess <laughs> i yeah. haven't lost it but i was working as a professional musician uh, i studied composition uh, at the juilliard school i wrote music mostly for theater and um at that time, I was still using in my studio a sequencer. I don't know that was before having a computer. There was this, you know, Yamaha sequencer to, to record the uh, MIDI music. And I decided I need to upgrade to a computer that was in 98. So it was a, a bit late already for having my first PC. I bought my first PC and got the software for making music. And then one day by accident, I downloaded a software called TrueSpace um which was back then one of those one of the cg 3d modeling lighting software that tried to be more kind of um uh, i guess friendly to new users um i didn't know what it was i thought it was something for music but then i watched their demos and they were like taking a bunch of meta blobs that was a thing back then and yeah. combining them together into shapes and i was looking at it and i just it was amazing for me and the uh, like my visual side that was hidden since the age of five when I loved to draw kind of started waking up. Um, I was really intrigued. So I downloaded this. I, I bought the software. It came in a nice box with a book and everything um, and started teaching myself CG. I, I didn't know what it was, but it was just an amazing journey that started there. Then I, I went over and taught myself 3D Studio Max than Maya and they just kind of like swallowed books. There was not much online back then. There were no tutorials or online courses or anything like that. You had to buy books in a store and actually read them like a Maya book or a Max book. And um, yeah, and I was still a musician. I used to like sit in rehearsals with the Maya book on the piano and kind of <laughs> in between cues, um, kind of read another section about whatever I mean, rigging or um, and started playing around with it and spending uh, sleepless nights doing this as a side thing. And for quite a few years, it was just a hobby. Um, I started, I really fell in love with a software called Vue mm -hmm. um, that is um, still exists um, mainly for doing CG landscapes, mm -hmm. uh, vegetation, um, you know, mountains, terrains. Uh, atmosphere. I, I, I love, uh, I love mountains. I love landscapes. I, I love uh, landscape photography. So I kind of really fell in love with the idea that you can create your own landscape photography out of nothing. Um, and I guess I, you know, I did that a lot and became kind of good at it. So at some point, um, Eon Software, which was the French company that made Vue, and their uh, CEO, who was the person who started that software, they contacted me and asked me if um, I want to work for them. 
and it was oh. the first time that I actually worked in something that was not music. Um, I canceled all my bookings and joined them and for two years worked for them, uh, did a lot of demo renders and demo scenes for their for the software. So if you bought that mm -hmm. software at that point, um, you would uh, you would get some of my demo scenes on that extra CD CD-ROM. Oh, cool! That was still the days of CD-ROM. <laughs> um, yeah, that was around two thousand five. Um, and I so, think so that... between the between the point where you were a musician and getting into CG, you were were you um, working in in orchestras? What uh, you were professionally working as a musician and studying yeah. CG in the background. Yes, I was working professionally as a as a composer for theater. So yeah. I would usually be booked on a certain uh, theater production, yeah. um, would sit in rehearsals with the actors, with the director, would write the music, would, would go home, would record it, or if it was with live players, you know, uh, notate it and, and write the sheet music for the players. Go. It, it was mainly spending times in rehearsals, and it was from yeah. production to production as a kind of a freelance artist. I also did some other things. I taught music. I, uh, I wrote uh, some classical music. I worked with choirs and all the time also uh, kept doing like CG and wow. visual effects work. And um, yeah, at that point I started, you know, watching visual effects in movies and paying attention to them. And I, I mm. remember, you know, the Lord of the Rings trilogy for me was like, a, was a point you know just watching the matte paintings and again i i really love environment so and you know they they had they did amazing work there mm -hmm. i said you know maybe one day i'll be working in a company like ilm or something or i'll do this kind of environments but uh there's not much chance i mean i'm a musician and um ilm called me one day i <laughs> ilm singapore i mean they emailed me they didn't call me off you know offering me um a job at ilm singapore as an artist, um, it was really surprising. But in retrospect, I understood how it went. They started using Vue on Pirates of the Caribbean. That's right. Yeah, um, I remember that. And their so their their um, environment artists started looking at the demo scenes, and then they saw my name and they saw that I was doing these. So I guess they were like, "Oh, why don't we just get this person over to Singapore?" Makes uh, sense. <laughs> as a view as a view artist um so they you know they contacted me for me it was like a dream come true i was already 40 uh with a family two kids yeah. i somehow convinced my wife that um it would be good to move to singapore at least for a little while um so we did um and then i came there and the team that actually wanted me is, was already replaced by another team and they they said that they don't really want to use view anymore <clears throat> so they didn't know what to do with me and i didn't know much else they asked me if i know compositing i said that uh, uh what's compositing <laughs> 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 and they were like okay we'll teach you so I learned compositing. Um, I had a good teacher. He just won an Oscar, um, uh, Brian Connor. He, he's at Dineg. He's a supervisor at Dineg now, and he won the mm -hmm. Oscar for Dune. Um, he was a really good teacher. I learned a lot there at ILM, and um, I focused on compositing. I realized that I actually enjoyed a lot. This is not something I did before. Um, um, I like I like being at the end of the of the chain, so to say, so mm -hmm. that knowing that what I do at the end is what goes to the client, to the director or, um, and you know, do you have a lot of responsibility in that sense as a compositor, because you're setting up the final look of the shot, even if that shot mm -hmm. had a lot of other artists working on at the end, you know, you are supposed to make it all look good. Uh, I like that. And I also realized that I want to be a supervisor. Uh, once right. I watched the supervisors at work there, realized that I I really want to do that. I was just starting. I spent two years there, and then my wife um, was accepted to a doctorate in New York at NYU, so we moved to New York. And that's where I joined a small company in New York called Brainstorm Digital that was doing a lot of uh, film work. And I started there as a compositor, became a comp supervisor, and 
soon after that became their their main VFX supervisor, and I w worked there for ten years, um, working on mostly on feature film, also on some um, television series. The uh, Boardwalk Empire was the one that uh, we received an Emmy for. Right. Um, we we did some other, but the majority of the work was uh, feature film. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I moved to Fuse Effects. Um, I moved as a um, VFX supervisor and head of 2D. I'm focusing on the head of 2D part now. So I'm in charge of the, the whole 2D department in the New York office, um, which includes the compositors and, and matte painters. And right. that's it. <laughs> Wow, incredible, incredible journey there. I mean, you've, you're talking about multiple <clears throat> career changes and change, moving countries and following your dreams and accomplishing your childhood dreams. And I think it's really, really interesting at uh, being someone that <clears throat> runs a school. And we have a lot of people that come through our doors who want to study various different ages. And I, I definitely, we, we teach people from, you know, say that youngest around 20 maybe slightly younger sometimes but predominantly between 20 and and 40 to 50 um and certainly people who get to to the age of 40 have a similar question which is can i if they haven't if they haven't already been doing it like is is it too late kind of thing you know is there is a is a question i hear a lot of like am i too old to get into a new career and i i have my own um answers that I give them, but I'd love to hear your perspective on because you told us you got into it at the age of 40. Well, you know, there is there. It's a, it's a really good question because there are professions where you don't really judge the age. Like if you say a doctor, you don't think somebody age 60 cannot be a doctor, right? If you say a lawyer or, or, or a banker, uh, we're like, sure, 60, 70, great. But with visual effects, we feel a little bit like, oh, you're 50. That's kind of old for visual effects. And the reason is, is that visual effects is young. Right. So the very first pioneers of, of visual effects are now in their 70s. Mm -hmm. um, the people who did the first, you know, the, the first Jurassic Park or the, that were pioneering the work, it's, it's still very, very young. So it does give you a kind of a sense that it's a it's a young people's place um but it's not quite true if you look at any company you will see that the most experienced people in the higher positions usually are people who are already in middle age plus and i definitely think that there is no limit to when you can start this um it's true that a lot of people get their first education in visual effects or cg in general animation at a college and that you usually go to a college when you're in your early 20s but there are a lot a lot of people like me who never studied this in college and picked it up much later and it's a, it's a kind of craft that you can you don't have to learn through an academic establishment to be good at it's right. not like let's say a lawyer or a doctor you can be an amazing cg artist or 2d artist and never go to school so you can literally started at 40 or 50 if you want i i definitely encourage people to to not look at, at their age as like a disability when you, you you get to that because even if you haven't done visual effects before you have a lot of experience in other things i worked with directors in the theater for many years it helped me being to be a better supervisor because you you work with directors as a supervisor Th that experience as a in team working and you know working with other creative people i think it's really inspiring to hear you talking about this especially for anyone considering a, a career transition around between 40 and 50 and then to hear the encouragement from someone who's done it to prove that you've proved it's possible not only is possible but you've also become successful at it and accomplished the, a lot of the things it sounds like that you you wanted to so it, it's it's would you would you what advice would you give to somebody <clears throat> who was considering a career transition in general, and especially if, if they've already had a career? I think the, um, my first advice is that you got to like it. Um, like, don't do something that you don't really like, because it's going to be harder for you to succeed at it. If you like it, do it. That's the first thing. 
Uh, I always had this kind of <laughs> cyclic thing where I started music. There was nothing in the world I cared except music, you know, as a teenager. That was the world and it was classical music. So it's a bit weird, you know, it's like these weird teenagers until I went to a performing high performing arts high school. And then when I did it professionally, at some point it became a little maybe boring because it became a job. Um, I say you want to have at least for if you want to learn, you have to have that passion first. Mm. Um, and then the other thing is um, just um, do stuff, do stuff and post it wherever, because you never know who's going to watch something that you did maybe a year ago and it will ring some bell or somebody will say, oh, that guy did that. Maybe we should have him. So if you're doing things, um, do as much as you can. If you're, let's say you're an animator, do animations, do little animations, post them wherever at, you know, art station or on LinkedIn. Um, I have the, the story. I don't know if it's true, but there was this guy that, that did like uh, the, the, the facial kind of um, he um, he was so good at what he did or doing deep fakes that he took an ILM shot mm. and did it better. And then they hired him and he just posted <laughs> it on YouTube. So uh, today there are so many avenues for artists who are not yet professional to post their stuff. And I, as a, as a, as a head of department that I work a lot in recruiting, I look a lot at LinkedIn, for example, that's my, mm. that's my social network, professional so, social network area. Um, and then sometimes I see someone posting something and it's like, oh, that person is really good at matte painting. Maybe we can talk to him. So that's my advice. Just don't be shy, post things, put on your website, you know, use uh, places like our station to, to, uh, to post your renders that this book that I I'm sure we'll talk about later that I just, um, that was just released. Uh, I was looking for artwork and I was looking specifically for photorealistic renders because that's what the book is about. And I found almost all the material on art station. And these are artists that I have never met that are from other countries all over the world that the only way I could see their work is through ArtStation and because they posted there. So that's my advice. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I, I re <clears throat> definitely resonate with a lot of that. Um, myself, having got into it through VJing for me and originally doing visuals in, in performances. And um, that was a one way back then when it was books and CDs and <laughs> that kind of stuff that you described. It was a way of getting it out in front of people and you, you, I think you also get um, people see it, they can send your encouragement, which helps you move down that path. And as you said, um, your, your story is really interesting about the, the, the view story, because that um, you probably never would have predicted that that would have got you noticed by ILM, but that yeah. was the thing which got you that job. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. so be, I think I think it's really good advice. Um, and I know that there's a lot of different people that listen to this from different age ranges and backgrounds. And it's, it's really great to hear the encouragement. And, and I, I think it's a very important point as well that you do have to, to love doing what you're doing, regardless of whatever it is, because any of these things takes a lot, a lot of hours and you're, you're only going to push through those moments if you're passionate about it. Yeah. Great advice. Um, so. Well, what, let's uh, let's talk, seeing as you brought it up, let's talk about your your book. I would love to hear more about it. Um, your your book that's just come out. I know you've released a couple of books. Uh, yeah, this is my second book, but uh, I guess I'll talk about it first. So, um, I I'm I was always fascinated with photorealism or or just the idea of synthesizing reality with digital means. I had the same fascination in music. I, I started as a classical musician, you know, playing piano and writing music for orchestras or, but I, at, at some point I got really, really interested in electronic music, but I, it started with um, listening to um, a musician, Japanese musician called Tomita. Um, 
who used to back then use one, uh, you know, those giant Moog synthesizers were, they were these modular things that took up an entire wall. Um, uh, looked like a, like the operators thing where you plug in those wires. So he yep. used to um, record multi-track performances of classical music using those electronic means. And he would record every, they were all mostly monophonic. So you would record every line separately, painstakingly on, you know, on, on a, you know, multi-track uh, tape that was tape back then. So I started with this because it was kind of a connection from classical to um, electronic. And then I, I got really into samplers and synthesizers um, and, and the, the kind of the, you know, the amazing path of like, producing something that is natural through through artificial means and trying to make it sound natural mm. and um there, there's something about using for example samplers and that applies to visuals too is that you may have a, a perfect uh you know sampled instrument because somebody actually played every note let's say on the violin and it was sampled into every single key that you press so i it feels like when you you press a key you're gonna you have a violin there so all you have to do is play the keyboard and it's going to sound like a violin but it doesn't <laughs> because for it to sound like a violin you have to understand how you play a violin and what the violin player does and i think in in the same way when you go into um into visuals um and especially cg and also 2d to a certain extent we have great tools now. We have amazing samplers, so to say. We have what we call physically based renderers, which first time in the history of CG actually emulate what light does rather than fake it. Right. Yeah. Because we have enough computing power nowadays to do it not just in offline rendering, but actually even in real time rendering, which is the, the, the biggest big thing. So we have physically based renderers that can produce extremely realistic result. It doesn't mean that what we create is photoreal because right. for, for that to be photoreal, we have to understand how realism works. So, um, and that's in a nutshell, what the book is about. Um, it's divided into four sections. The first section just talks about concepts of photorealisms from a, I'd say, a little bit more philosophical point of view. For example, what is the difference between how we see things and how a camera sees things? And does it really matter? And right. <clears throat> that's a good example, because if you take one, um, take defocus, for example. So we have defocus in our vision. If you put your finger on the side of your, you know, viewing field, uh, you will see it kind of blurry. It's it's a defocused area. Um, also, if you stick it right in front of your eye and you're focused on like a computer monitor, it will be out of focus, which is similar to a camera. But you cannot view your out of focus. You cannot look at your own out of focus places, right? But if you right. take a photo, you can see, you can look at the out of focus areas very clearly because you're watching <laughs> what the camera saw. So there's a big difference. So suddenly the focus becomes something that is visually interesting. And of course, as we all know, it's being heavily used in photography and cin cinematography as a tool, uh, which we cannot do. We, we either see sharp or it's blurred. Like we, we can't see the blurred part. So that kind of difference, difference is important for creating photorealistic um, renders, for example, because we are not imitating our human eye. We're imitating cameras. And so the focus becomes a very, very, very important part of making things look real. If, you're def if your depth of field doesn't make sense, it doesn't matter how well you textured your subjects and how well you lit them, it's still going to look weird. It's not going to look like a camera took it. And you, you ruin photorealism. So that was, that's the first part. There's a lot of discussions about that. And the second part, I, I do not mention anything CG or any software or anything at all. I actually try to look at the real world and explain how light works, but explain it in the way that us artists can understand, because I realized when I started to writing the book that 
it's all high level physics right um, um and um if you can easily very easily easily go into the physical part but people like me who who don't like to see numbers or equations will be turned off by that like we won't you know as an i try to explain these things in a way that an artist can relate to that is visual um anything from like what is the difference between specular and diffuse reflections are these like two type of reflections is it just one is more organized the other is more messy so it's basically the same thing are there like different levels between diffuse and specular um physics no physicists know all this <laughs> they uh um, yeah. they know all this but they talk in a different language they talk in numbers and equations so um i think that this is the core of the book that's the most important part and then the two other parts are looking at recreating realism um in in digitally the the third part is all about cg or 3d world and that's talking about the tools that we have for texturing for rendering for lighting and so forth without being too software specific and the fourth part is about 2d because even compositing you can ruin photorealism very easily every kind of green screen key that is not good enough that the edges don't feel natural that they lack motion blur or defocus or whatever is killed photorealism and again you can create an amazing CG element beautifully lit with all the detail and the compositor is going to ruin it by doing something to it or the or of course the opposite and part of the book also talks about how much of a collaborative effort it is in a in a VFX facility especially on shots that involve you know CG and animation and 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 compositing how much of a collaborative effort it is to achieve photorealism because every person in that line contributes or or destroys something yeah. <laughs> the opposite of contributes yeah yeah that's really fascinating and a yeah, really important time for it as well because i know that people have been making talking about photorealism for years and certainly in my journey as a vfx artist i, I remember at the beginning having talking about lighting and um, feeling like I was really bad at it. And I, I essentially didn't really understand that what I was putting into the computer was not not um, carrying through into the render correctly. And I didn't know that at the time until like until we started understanding linear and really knowing what was going on there. I felt I felt like I really didn't know and it wasn't for me. And then things started to evolve. So it's been a real evolution of the technology in the last 15, 10, five years to the point now we have some, like you said, uh, better simulation of reality and we can actually get some predictable results out of these systems. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look at the old movies, the good ones, I don't take Jurassic Park. I, I always bring in the, the original. Yeah. Um, I always like to bring it as an example because it was one of the earliest. And you look at it today and it still looks great. Yeah. Part of it is how the director used CG. It did not over flood every single second with CG. You create yeah. anticipation. You just have regular people in a regular environment and you know that some dinosaur is going to come there suddenly into the frame, but it takes time and you build. So some of it is just the artistry of making a good movie. And it is a good movie. But you think of it, these people, um, you know, Dennis Muren and all, all these guys from ILM back then, they did all this with technology that we don't even have on our phones anymore. Like every <laughs> phone has a lot more computing power than their, like, you know, the, the workstations that they used back then. Yet they managed, and, and yes, they didn't have global illumination they didn't have, you know, uh, physically based renders, but they still managed to make things look amazing. So uh, what I want to say by that is that we, we have a lot more tools now, and it's much easier nowadays to throw something into the CG scene, click render, you know, put some objects, texture them, 
put a you know HDR or Sky Dome, whatever render, and it's gonna look pretty good. <laughs> yeah, but we gotta be careful. We, I mean, all of us, not to become too lazy mm. and rely too much on the on the physically plausible kind of algorithms that somebody already pre-made for us and rely rely still rely on our eyes to tweak things because at the end good vfx and good renders in general do not necessarily follow um the exact rules of nature or physics mm. they just look good <laughs> and right. if uh, cinematographers know that and photographers because they're not just going to use the light as it is yeah you're out it's a sunny day you say okay this is the light right they're going to add their own lights to make things look better. So it's yeah. still an art. It's still an art. <laughs> and a science. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's really, really interesting to hear you explaining the, the side where, yes, there is technology involved and it's got better and it's got easier, but <clears throat> there's no substitute for using your eye. And, and do you have uh, any advice for people out there who are wondering Obviously, you've got to use, in general, the technology that you're given. Most people aren't inventing their own, so you're going to work with software packages that exist. But in terms of the skill set, um, how you can help to develop your eye and, and be able to understand what you're looking for and how to make those decisions. Absolutely. I say my first advice is get away from the computer, take a camera and go out and shoot photos. Mm. Because, like I said, everything we do, we're emulating photography in cinematography. Everything that we look at that we say, oh, this looks so real. I thought it was a photo. Um, comes from the fact that the people who made it understand how photographs look. And I am sometimes amazed at how junior artists have a hard time feeling, uh, for example, depth of field. If you shoot a lot of photography, and I mean, you know, on manual and, you know, pay attention to these things, you get a sense of how how wide or narrow the depth of field will be based on where your focal point is. You just It just feels, you look at a shot and you look at senior artists, say for compositors looking at a shot and say, ah, the, the, the defocus doesn't feel right. And you're like, how do you know? Do you have a tool to tell you how much defocus should be? And there's no, there's no tool. Unfortunately, there is a green screen five feet away from the camera. So we cannot see anything beyond that. So we don't know how much the focus will be on an object that's a hundred feet away, but we can just feel it. So, and that goes to everything. It goes to lens flares. It, it goes to aberrations. It goes towards every little detail that makes the difference between a really, really nicely done CG and a, a photoreal render. So my first advice is just do as much photography as you can, because your eyes will learn, even if you don't notice, and you'll have better eyes to judge your own work. Um, that's the first one. The second one is read some books. Um, I'm not going to particularly recommend any, any books, but people like should read your book too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, there's quite a few really good books. That, that maybe you may read through stuff and say, oh, I know this, I know this, I know this. And then there's going to be one paragraph that will kind of open up your eyes a little bit or your mind to something you never thought about. And that by itself is priceless. Um, because we tend to get swept into the software. We can, tend to get swept, to, let's say we're doing Unreal. So get into the world of Unreal. This is how I do things. This is where I grab. This button does that. This does that. Mm -hmm. And we we kind of start spending too much time in this little cubicle of a software. And you want to be, of course, able to use the software to your best advantage. You want to know it. You want to know how to do stuff. But it really helps to get away from it. Right. Yeah, it's a great, great advice. <clears throat> I, I feel like it as technologies evolved as well through photography even that with the automation of of cameras is taking people away from controlling the the components of the camera and understanding what what those 
are actually doing and being able to make creative choices with it. I, I did quite a bit of darkroom work when I was younger and having to go through that experience, which is not something anyone would do now in generally, yeah. but, but it forced me to pay attention to the small details and, and be careful with the choices, take time looking through the viewfinder. Cause I know that every time you press that button, it costs money. And you know that I think some of those things people don't have to go through now are, are, uh, is a good thing, but it also costs people in terms of the knowledge sometimes. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Look, I mean, people kind of tend to, especially young people, look at us older people and say like, oh, come on, don't give us all this crap, you know, because it's like we say, oh, when I was a kid, we used to use dial phones. Every time you wanted to dial a number, you actually had to like do every digit. And if you messed up, you got to start <laughs> doing the whole thing again. And now you just click on the name of the person and there you go. So, so what does it mean? Does it mean that we had a... We, we had it better because we had to work harder to reach uh, to, to get to some point not necessarily but like you mentioned darkroom yeah we're not doing it anymore very few are actually doing that anymore very few productions are using film anymore is it bad not necessarily i mean the today's digital cameras are have a wider dynamic yeah. range than film it's not it's not yep. really that we lost something here. Um, so we don't necessarily have to go back all the way to stuff that does not exist anymore, but there's fundamental things that are not going to change, right? Look, like you said, looking through a viewfinder and thinking about that shot as if this is the only chance you have to shoot it, which was the case when we still were using film, is to say, okay, if that's the only chance I have, and I'm not going to just click the shutter a zillion times now and then at home, choose the best version and then Photoshop it. No, yeah, I want it. That forces you to look at everything, the exposure, how you expose, you know, how, where you, how much, you know, your focus. It's, it's a lot of decisions, you know, your shutter speed. And I think that same kind of um, attention to detail is, is, really absolutely necessary to produce amazing looking CG. Maybe it'd be an interesting exercise that people could set themselves in. So you get one, one button click and that's it. And you gotta, you gotta get the best shot you can. Yeah. Know. Look, simulation artists know that because right, yeah. you click, <laughs> you change one value and then you sit there and wait <clears> for <throat> the thing to simulate. And then you're like, yeah. Ooh, I should have changed it to another number. So they, they know, you know, they're like lions in the savannah. They're not going to move unless it's absolutely necessary. So you learn how to conserve energy. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. It's really interesting because they, they, they get to experience render times. It's like we used to have to it's been to get, maybe set it off overnight or maybe even multiple days before you get to see what it looked like. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. And now we're moving into the real time arena where more and more of this is becoming possible in real time is even more important or even less opportunity to to have to make those decisions with with consciousness and, and knowing what you're doing are you are you guys um using real-time technology much in at fuse well F fuse has now a, a real-time department that's it, uh, been um said a couple years ago and they they are expanding on that realizing just like every other, other company that this is becoming a very important part of the visual effects process the majority of the work we do um is still you know traditional visual effects in the sense that productions uh you know are working the same way you know you still have green screens and but we did do a few productions that i remember in the past year were you know some of the work was using uh, LED screens um, and some of the work we had to replace those LED screens in yeah. post because directors or showrunners decided that they don't like the result. Yeah. Um, but this is, it's becoming more and more of a, of a, of a common workflow in VFX and, and I think it's great. I think that uh, um, you know, the ability to, I mean, nobody likes green screens, for example, as a compositor, I can tell you that we spend so much energy and time trying to get the perfect edges just to replace something. 
it's a it's a very it's a really medieval technology like think of it sticking in front of a camera this brightly lit oversaturated screen um <laughs> one time we shot uh for a tv series called the, the men who built america and uh, uh it was all kind of period stuff so they had this cart with two mules or horses that we put in front of a green screen just to shoot that because we were supposed to replace the background with something else the mules hated it they put them in front <laughs> of the green screen they got really really upset and started moving impatiently and at some point they couldn't hold it so a green screen is goes against everything right like it, it spills and it reflects light now just the idea that we can have a background that is actually lighting uh, or at least partially lighting the actors with the actual colors that are on the background is is amazing. The fact that we can time cameras um, to it, um, that that you know that we can do all that and get a much more coherent um, result, I think is amazing. But I think filmmakers and artists need to also be aware of the dangers. For example, if you don't like it later on. Now you'll have to roto everything in order to replace it. And you basically, so in, in uh, virtual production relies on, on, you know, very strong kind of pre-production work because you want to come to the shoot day with everything looking perfect. Um, that said, you know, the, um, like talking about the technology, um, the fact that we can change things in real time is is great for cg artists because you get immediate feedback you can adjust things on the set it's not too late um and these are i'm i'm looking forward to the days where we will not use offline rendering at all in visual effects um mm -hmm. which is still being done because there's still a there's certain levels of you know of quality or or, or specific components of lighting that still are still hard to get with you know real-time engines uh like subsurface scattering that you can but to a certain extent it's kind of a you you know that you're going to get you know a very high quality result using one of the traditional kind of offline renderings but eventually we'll we'll all be using real time it seems it certainly seems that way as it's and the benefits to not only the visual effects artists, the filmmakers too, in being able to see things in real time, the actors responding to things better on set, the the iteration speed that you can go through in in making decisions, seeing the immediate result and pivoting rather than waiting to have for weeks to go through dailies and approvals and then coming back for changes. It's yeah, it's a an exciting time, but definitely compromises. It, it's for, for filmmakers, it's fantastic because um, otherwise you're seeing a bunch of actors in front of a green screen pretending to be somewhere. It It's very hard to be a director with that. I've mm -hmm. worked with directors who were very suspicious of green screens or visual effects because they can't see it. Mm -hmm. They like to look at the monitor and, and see what the shot looks like. And then, uh, you know, and there are, of course, directors who, who are totally fine with it. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, and it felt like nowadays you have to be this kind of director if you want to succeed in like the, the higher market, higher budget films. Like you have to be able to see just a bunch of green screens and kind of say, okay, the shot looks great. <laughs> so there's nothing there. Yeah. Um, and I think real time is, is going to change that. Virtual production is going to change that in the sense that you can go back to being a bit more of a visual director uh, in the sense that rely on what you're seeing right now uh, in front of you. Um, yeah. That said, we have to remember that it's still basically just, you know, it's just a screen. Behind. It's it's um, it's like rear projection. It's an eggshell. It's not a real environment. The actors cannot step into it. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting watching it evolve. And I, I think that might, I think uh, the mules hated it might be my favorite quote for this podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if even the mules hate it, then if, if, yeah, yeah. Just imagine how the artists 
you know, what they think about <laughs> green screens. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so I had one uh, question coming in here. Um, somebody's asking about what software uh, that you'd recommend people to start learning, particularly talking about ones that are less expensive. They were thinking about Fusion. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Of um, for compositing, F Fusion is um, is a compositing software. Yeah. Um, that is a, it's a very good question because if you if you want to become a professional artist in this industry, you'd rather learn the tools that are being used everywhere because eventually you're yeah. going to be hired based on your knowledge of certain software. In the VFX world, um, Nuke is the king as far as compositing. It's being used almost in every single facility. In the uh, motion graphics and commercial world, there is a lot of use of um, art After Effects um adobe unfortunately fusion never caught up to any of these industries as much as i actually hope to because they're they're a free software um so i say you learn it if you uh, nuke is expensive they have a learning edition though um mm. so like most other softwares i think that between fusion and nuke i would try and learn nuke just because that is the and they're very similar they're both node based uh, compositing software i i would err on, on, on nuke and yep. same for 3d i mean of course unreal is its own category um but as far as like traditional cg software the most heavily used in vi visual effects are houdini and, and and maya so i would focus on either and probably not even both because they're very different and uh, houdini is such a complex software that you really need to focus on it to become good. But a lot of VFX uh, houses are now, that they've changed their 3D pipeline to be mostly Houdini and Unreal Engine. And mm. they're, they're relying more and more on, on Unreal for lighting and um, rendering and um, relying on Houdini for the effects work and you know what Houdini does best. Right. Yeah, and Houdini's graduating itself into not just becoming a not just being an effects tool but being useful for other parts of the workflow layout and look development you know in, in time but it's, it's really interesting software. to hear yeah yeah it's really really interesting to hear your perspective from where you are and great great advice um which i often give to people's not not just to take my word for it go ask studios so, well, this is what i did in the beginning 15 years ago when I got into visual effects was ask, ask the people that were using it, what tools do you use and go learn that. And that's where I, why I learned Maya at the time, um, which now, you know, I know that, as you said, a lot of people are using it, but that that's changing. And the still the best question that you can ask, I think is who's using what and go learn yeah, that. Definitely. I mean, if you can go and be really good in cinema 4d, but that means that you'll probably be looking for work in more of the motion graphics and design areas of the industry because I don't know many visual effects houses that use Cinema 4D. I'm sure there are some, but it's not yeah. a very common software. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and yeah, important to know what uh, what you're getting into. What whether you want to work for large places like ILM or smaller studios. Have had the been lucky to work at both, and they they not that one's necessarily better than the other but yeah different different places have different qualities and it's really really good advice um and good yeah good to hear your perspective on how the industry is changing it's shifting the tools that are being used is are shifting so where it was when i was getting into it maya absolutely no question of anything else now that's not necessarily the case so it's still a workhorse and for sure but yeah but there is a shift definitely and it's important to know that especially you think for people getting into the industry but also for people who are in the industry who are wanting to keep up or even get ahead i think it's important to i'm, I'm obviously going to sound incredibly biased about learning i do run a school but i think to keep up with the knowledge is also very important even once you've got in 
you can you can become out of date by not keeping pace with current tools. No, yeah, it's, 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 it's important to keep it up. Um, somebody was he was asking a question about um, do you prefer green screen versus blue screen? I know that it's in general what you're shooting in front of. <laughs> rather than the color that you like but <laughs> well i hate both but <laughs> right yeah you hate them both um, equally there is a there there are reasons to use blue instead of green green usually keys better in most uh circumstances uh blue works better in low light um obviously if you have people wearing green or you have a bunch of plants you'd use uh blue um there's blue you know reflects less uh, it's, it's, it, it, you know, it's a bit easier to deal. You know, I wouldn't say it's a bit easier to deal with spill. I think the main importance between both using either blue or green is to make sure, sure they're lit properly because mm -hmm. the main issues coming from hard to key green or blue screens is that they're either overly lit. So they lose their saturation and become kind of whitish. And then it's not a blue or green screen; it's just a white screen, uh, or they they go too dark, and again they they become impossible to to key based on that. So, um, in you know, good good DPs know which color, which green or blue to use depending on the situation. Right. Um, I wanted to ask you something, which I guess we sort of touched on before, but uh, the with the advent of machine learning algorithms coming into certain different parts of the visual effects process. We sort of talked about deep fakes earlier on. Um, what are your, your thoughts on how that is helping the process in visual effects? It's a, it's a fascinating subject and I'm really excited about it. Um, even if you, um, for example, use Nuke 13, like the la latest iteration of Nuke, you, you wouldn't necessarily associate compositing with machine learning, but they have, you know, they have new tools there that rely on, on machine learning. Um, there, there's several sides to it. First of all, there is a lot of time consuming hard work in visual effects, and a lot of it can be done through algorithm, or through machine learning algorithms. Um, and it's already happening. It's just maybe not as good as like, let's just use it, for example, rotoscoping, which is time consuming. It's laborious and it, you know, there are already algorithms that do it pretty well. Um, there is, but there is the higher level of creativity of creation that is just it's mind boggling. Uh, for example, virtual environments, the, the you know, the, the ability to create an, an infinite environment that it based on is based on the number of rules, but also on, on, you know, on machine learning, um, the whole facial thing, like we talked about deep fakes, it's not, you know, the name deep fake sounds very lowly, <laughs> makes it sound <laughs> like some, some kind of, um, it's an amazing new way of changing or replacing faces or it's not, it doesn't have to be just faces. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a completely new kind of thinking. Um, instead of creating a CG mask, so to say, and animating it and tracking it to a face, uh, um, you know, the process literally just shifts the pixels, changes the color and of the pixels to take the same expression, same face, but look, make it look like somebody else based on the material that it's being learning. Um, I can tell you that we've been dabbling with this. It's still very, it's in its infancy in the sense that you can do amazing stuff that look great on YouTube. But once you get into a show that's 4K and you know the directors or um, showrunners are looking at it in a DI room on a giant screen, the deep fake part ne still needs a lot of compositing work to work um, because yep. no two faces are similar in the structure and all, but we are, there's constant, you know, improvement there. And um, I just, I can't wait for like 10 years from now to see how, how much of the work we do can be done through machine learning and also how many new avenues, avenues it opens. I just, today I saw on LinkedIn, and I lost it, 
somebody who's a CG supervisor, maybe it's Canline, posted a bunch of ca CG characters, portraits of like these weird kind of alien looking characters that apparently were created by machine learning. And they were some of the most amazing um, characters I've ever seen, CG characters. Fantastic. So, who knows? I don't think any of us do. <clears throat> we're, we're just seeing it unfold and no one person probably has the ultimate vision, but it's a fun, it's a fun time to be in for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to, or oh, there's one more question that's come in here. Um, um, somebody was asking about with uh, ILM uses its own in-house game engine. I see the that's probably referring to if, if somebody's talking about using in-house proprietary technology, I think the question is asking how might you gear yourself up to use something that, I mean, I was in that situation, used Xeno and I'd never used it before. I had to learn it in two or three days before making some shots. So Same for um, me, <laughs> I remember right. learning Xeno and Mars, they're, they're tracking them. So, I mean, the thing with proprietary software is that you cannot really learn it unless you, you no. work with a proprietor. Um, but I think that, and I didn't even know that ILM is building their own um, real-time engine, but I'm sure that if you are really good with Unreal or Unity for that matter, you have enough basics to be able to learn a new software. I'm right. sure it's not far off, you know, they're just, so even though you can't, you know, well, we have at Fuse, we have our own kind of uh, proprietary pipeline tools that I, I have to teach every time a new artist joins us. I have to right. do that onboarding thing. Yeah, there's no real way around that, learning somebody's pipeline. But so, yeah. so the, in essence, you're saying learn the common aspects which are going to apply regardless of what software you're using. Those are the most important things to know anyway. Yes, and 3D software now, also traditional 3D software, you know, Maya, Max, you know, Cinema 4D, they're all very similar in the end. Mm. They, they're, you know, the, we're getting closer and closer to all these software doing pretty much the same thing. It's yep. just a little bit different interface, different buttons. They're not such, you know, huge differences between all the software we're using. Right. Under the hood, it's all polygons and light calculations and yeah. just some different, different UI on top of it in general, except for a Houdini, which is like an alien life form. It, it is also, it's just like, yeah. it's a different language, but once you understand the language, it's also doing the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh... um, so how can people find out more about what you do? You, I'd love to, to uh, we can definitely share the links to your new book. Um, you have a new book that's just come out. Um, I know you have a previous book that you published. Um, yeah. Is there that's... any? This is the previous one, the uh, yeah. filmmaker's guide to visual effects. This is more about visual effects in general, and and you know, um, so both books are available on Amazon, so you can just find them there. Um, I have a website though; I I really haven't updated it for a long time, but still has some nice reels and from stuff that we did at Brainstorm. Um, and I'm very active on LinkedIn. That is kind of like my professional. Um, network place. I, I use it at work even for hiring people, for finding new talent. It's it's very successful, I think, for for the professional work. Um, so, you know, everyone's welcome to uh, you know, to contact me on over LinkedIn. I use it Fantastic. Great. Well, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to say. Um, if there's anything else that you you want to share um feel free uh I, we can we'll definitely i've seen in the chat there a few of those links being posted already but um yeah just wanted to say uh thank you oh there's one more question before yeah. i do that um is the filmmaker's guide to vfx um kind of basic to fundamentals or does it go deep is the question um, 
so yeah let me just explain the, very shortly what the book is about i wrote this yeah. book for filmmakers for producers directors editors who work with visual effects but do not do visual effects um i i wrote it out of necessity because i was collaborating with filmmakers on the set and realized that they they because they lack a lot of knowledge uh, sometimes it makes their life much harder for, for example why is this shot more expensive than this one i thought that they're both the same they both you know have, um under i i wanted to give the uh, filmmakers the ability to understand visual effects without going into like software and the more technical part what i realized after the book came out is that it's actually very it's a favorite with uh visual effects students or, and it's being used in a lot of courses of visual effects in different universities and colleges because I wrote it for filmmakers, but it also gives artists a kind of an overview of the whole process, what every what it, everyone is doing and how it relates to the actual filmmaking process. So instead of just, if you're like focusing on being a texture artist, you just learn a lot about texturing, um, that film gives you like the, the, the whole arch. And you understand what pre-production is, what, what you know, post-production is, what's going on on set, what are the different uh, crafts. So it it's, it is definitely not going deep into the art itself or as as the second book. Um, it is more of an overview of everything visual effects. Great, that's very important, and I think today we hear this more more than ever the generalists are becoming more and more important as they were in the beginning in the dawn of visual effects so yeah. everybody was a generalist yeah. but then became specialists particularly in film but now we're seeing generalists the kind of rise of the generalist coming back again so i guess even more important to have a broader knowledge even if you're not doing all the things to understand what they all mean exactly and especially if you have aspirations to become a, a vfx supervisor or comp supervisor or cg supervisor any kind of supervision role you really have to have an understanding of everything and you also have to understand the client the filmmaker you have mm. to see this stuff through their own eyes so yeah that's the first book so one one last question for me then in that case um what what makes a good visual effects supervisor oh <laughs> That's the whole thing. Yeah, um, that uh, usually the VFX supervisors come from two possible backgrounds. Either they came from behind the camera, being like second unit director or a DP, um, or they came from the box, from being an artist or a comp supervisor, CG supervisor. Now, in either way, there's something they need to learn in order to become VFX supervisor. If you came from the onset. Uh, experience you have to really understand what the artists are doing uh, if you come from the artist side you have to learn the onset experience what it means because it's a different world on the set it's a hierarchy of roles At, when I first started going on set I used to like go and say oh can we just move this chair a little bit okay I'm gonna go and move it you do that and you're <laughs> done with you should not <laughs> touch that chair because there's a person that by the union, uh, you know, definition, it's their job to move the chair. Um, it's a very different world. Good VFX supervisors, I think, combine both worlds, are able to look at stuff both from the filmmaker point of view and the artist point of view, um, are able to uh, represent the artists who are going to do the work on the set and are able to represent the filmmakers who just shot this piece with the artist. Um, it doesn't, you know, it helps to be a diplomat. It helps to know how to um, manage people and also how to get along with people. Um, you want to be friends with the people on the set because you need things from them. Um, you need to be making split second decisions on the set. It's different than doing stuff on a computer. In CG, you can try or 2D try this, try that, take a break. On the set, you have 150 people waiting there for you to say, go this way or go that way, or do it this way or do it that way. It's very stressful. Um, so a good supervisor knows how to um, insert themselves when they're, they're needed to and stay away when they're not. It's, it's an art by itself. I can go on about it 
I don't think we have the time. Maybe you, maybe we can <laughs> maybe we can have you back and do another uh, one, <laughs> or maybe there's another book. <laughs> yeah, in a few years. Sure. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you very much. I've enjoyed this conversation tremendously, and I wanted to thank you for your time. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for answering people's questions, and thanks for doing great great work out there in the world. And uh, yeah. Also, thank you very much to our listeners for tuning in. Thanks for yeah, being here with you. us today. It was um, a pleasure. Thanks. Absolute pleasure for us too. Um, and yeah, if you, anybody out there, if you're interested in what we do as a school, you can follow us at becomecgpro.com. Um, join us again in two weeks for another podcast. And thank you all. Hope you have a great day.